Welcome to the Jeffco DeAngelis Foundation podcast series focusing on school safety and security. My name is Kevin Carroll, Executive Director for the Foundation. Throughout this series, we will be engaging in informative conversations with local, national, and even internationally recognized experts in the arena of school safety. We will be exploring best practices in crisis preparation, response, and recovery, as well as gleaning lessons learned from these remarkable professionals. In special editions, like today's with Frank DeAngelis, we will also be having conversations with people who personally experience school and community shootings. The Jeffco DeAngelis Foundation originated in Jefferson County, Colorado, with a deep passion for and relentless commitment to sharing best practices in school safety and security with first responders as well as school and school district personnel. We, in partnership with Jefferson County Public Schools, support a -a one-of-a-kind training facility, the Frank DeAngelis Center for Community Safety. This former elementary school is now a premier training facility which has supported training for over 7,200 first responders. Our trainings encompass everything from the practical to the tactical, focusing on proven approaches to preparedness, response, and recovery. More can be learned about the training facility, our team of nationally recognized trainers, and the foundation by visiting www.deangeliscenter.org. And with that, it's my true pleasure to welcome our special guest today, Mr. Frank DeAngelis. As many of you are aware, Frank was the principal at Columbine High School in 1999 during the tragedy. Welcome, Frank. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Also joining us today is Mr. John McDonald, Executive Director of School Safety for Jefferson County Public Schools. Welcome, John. Thanks. Appreciate it, Kevin. Anytime I can hang out with you and Frank is a good day. (laughs) There you go. Uh, So, Frank, we're just going to have a conversation this morning for our listeners to learn more about you and Columbine, your experience, your learnings um, from that experience. But I'd like to start with your time um, before the tragedy, uh, your experience as an educator. If you might tell us a little bit about your path leading up to becoming the principal. Sure. I started back uh, 23 years old, young kid, and got offered to teach social studies at Columbine High School in 1999. It's real interesting. We were on year-round school, so I actually started in October and uh, started my first year there, and I was on a one-year contract and evidently did a decent job that they hired me back. And so as a history teacher and as a beginning teacher, you teach whatever they ask you to teach because you just want a job. And I did world history, American history, some sociology. And then I got an opportunity to be an assistant football coach and head baseball coach and did that. And I just loved what I was doing. And that took us through 1992. And all of a sudden in Jefferson County, uh, they wanted to try a new program, a dean's program. So I became one of the first dean of students in uh, Jefferson County. And this was through 92, 93. And then I had an opportunity, and this was one of the toughest decisions. Um, Principal at that time, Ron Mitchell, said there was going to be an opportunity to be an administrator. And all my friends and teachers said, why would I want to become one of them? You know, one of those (laughs) types of the dark side, yeah. 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 But I had a a teacher friend, a very close friend of mine, Susan Peters, who said, Frank, your job is changing, but you don't have to change as a person. Because I was so concerned that once I left the classroom, What I valued most about education was the relationships with the kids. And she said, now, instead of impacting 150 students in your social studies classes, you're going to have an impact of over 2,000 plus 150 staff members. So went into an assistant principal's position for two years, and then everything just worked out. Uh, Ron Mitchell ended up being an area administrator for Jefferson County. And I applied for the principalship and fortunately was able to get it. It was really ironic because... The reason I got into education was a high school teacher of mine, a psychology teacher, Chris Dittman, and he was also my baseball coach. And the two finalists for the job was Mr. Dittman and myself. And unbeknownst to me is he had a lot of experience. And I said, boy, this is a win-win. I'm either going to work for someone I admire or I'm going to be the principal. And it was real interesting. I found out later he went in and they were asking him, what does it take to be successful? And he was saying, you need the support of three groups, parents, students, and staff. And he said, if you have that, you're going to have a successful career. And he said, I'm not that person. That person is Frankie DeAngelis who's sitting out Mm -hmm. there. And so I ended up getting the job. What a compliment. The rest is history. Yeah, and he's one of my dearest friends. 
And then Ron uh, Mitchell that you mentioned later stayed on and, and became the school board president for he Jeffco did. Schools, didn't he? He did, and he was a mentor. I was so fortunate. I think one of the reasons that Columbine has had so much success during, I mean, it'll be coming upon 50 years in 2023 is there were only five principals prior to the tragedy. And I think there was that consistency now. And, you know, I was there for 18 years and Ron was there for eight or nine and Warren Hanks. And so it, that consistency really made a difference mm-hmm. in that community. Leadership matters. Right, it Leadership does. Leadership matters. So then, then there's this day, right? Uh, mm-hmm. The one that we wish never would have happened, uh, but it happened. Can you walk us through some of the events that you recall yeah. from that day? It's real interesting, uh, certain things that just are paramount on your mind. Is, you know, as a principal, one of the things, and I know, Kevin, you and I, we've done a lot of great work together. You've done a lot of great work, you know, as principals. But one of the things I think we all complain about is all the meetings we had and being oh, out of the yeah. buildings. And, Absolutely. You know, and one of the things that I really strive to do is be in the hallways. I loved cafeteria duty. I tell people then, they said, are you nuts? And I said, no, I really like that mm-hmm. time. But on that particular day, some things happened out of the ordinary. I didn't start out at Columbine. I was actually at a breakfast for our future business leaders of America. And so I was late getting to school. And the reason I'm sharing this is probably out of 175 days in which we met with the students, I'm down in the cafeteria during a lunch. We had two lunches, always on the landing there, welcoming kids and things of that nature. But that on that particular day, I was in my office waiting for Kiki Leba, and he was a teacher who student taught at Columbine. He was on a one-year contract, and so he, I could not find him. Finally, he walks into my office right at the beginning of a lunch, and it's real interesting to this day, and Kiki and I kind of tease, I don't know if I ever offered him a contract, but he's still working at Columbine 21 years later, and the reason I didn't is before we started that conversation, I remember it so vividly, my secretary, Susan White, comes running towards my office, and the door's shut, and there's a little window, and I can still see her face planting there, and I knew something was wrong. And the door opened up, and she said, Frank, there's been a report of gunfire. And in my mind, I said, first thing that crossed my mind, this has to be a senior prank. In my mm-hmm. 20 years at Columbine, count on two hands the number of fist fights we had and so i said this can't be happening we're about a month away from graduation and as high school principals you always worry about those senior pranks and things of that nature so I ran out of my office and then my worst nightmare became a reality because as i ran out of my office i told my secretary call 911 Kiki Leba ran down the other hallway to warn kids. And this was before all the drills, you know, the lockdown, lockout, even evacuation. The only drills we did back in 1999 were fire, fire drills. drills. That yeah. was it. And so we did the best we could. And as soon as I came out of my office, um, I encountered the gunman who was about 75 yards away. Mm. And it was amazing what I went through. And I learned later through counseling, I was going through fight, flight, and freeze in this sensory state stimulation and everything just seemed to slow down and I can remember thinking I had never been in a position like that what it was going to feel like to have a bullet pierce my body and thinking about my family and it was interesting because the fire alarm was so loud that we could not carry on a conversation and that was one of the hindrances when the SWAT team arrived but I was able to block that out and then I thought I walked very calmly and I sprinted towards a gunman and I've had law enforcement agents saying, Frank, you're unarmed. Why would you run towards a gunman? Because as educators, we've got to do everything to protect Protect our our kids. kids. And I had 20 girls, 20, 25 girls that were coming out of the locker room to go to a class, and they were unaware of what was happening. And so I knew if I could get us into the gym, there were exit doors or doors outside that once we verified it was safe to get them out, I knew we could get to a safe place. Everything was going as planned until I go to pull on the gymnasium door and it's locked. Mm. Girls are screaming, um, literally hearing the boots hit the ground of the gunman. The the sounds of the shots are getting closer. And then things start happening that I can't explain. And I reached in my pocket. I had a suit coat on and I had 25 keys on a key ring. And, you know, no, no keys were specially marked, but I reached in my pocket, the first key I stick in the door and it opened it on the first try, the the one. one. Mm -hmm. And 15 years in which I stayed after, I tried getting that one key and I couldn't do it. And it was, 
Really interesting last year, pretty emotional. We had our 20-year remembrance and invited back the classes of 99 through 2002. And many of the girls that were with me that day came up and they start crying. I start crying and all of a sudden we're sitting down and they said, I want to introduce you to my family. These are my kids. And if it wasn't for you finding that key, I wouldn't have wouldn't the, the opportunity to be here. Yeah. And I said, ladies, I wish I could tell you I had something to do with finding that key, but I didn't. Mm-hmm. But uh, we did that. And the thing, there's certain things that just weigh on my mind. Back then, I left the girls in the locker or in the gymnasium area because I needed to make sure it was safe to get them outside. And so all of a sudden, Jeff Coast Sheriff starts arriving, and I went back in to get the girls but then, thinking back to 20 years ago, I can't even imagine that we didn't have more damage or more, you know, people injured. The fact that they were planning their attack, and back then, they had a policy called Secure the Perimeter. And we had a school resource officer, Neil Gardner, who was actually exchanging gunfire with the two gunmen, along with Andrew Martin, who was a campus supervisor. But they were being informed that you cannot go in. We had responding officers coming from Denver, Boulder, Jefferson County, Littleton. And that was one of the most frustrating things for the people that were in the building because they were being told not to leave, help's on the way, all the help's outside. But they could not go in get to them. until SWAT arrived. And unfortunately, by the time SWAT got there, I think it was close to 50 mm-hmm. minutes. It was not that anything the police officers wanted to do, but that was a protocol at the time. And, and I know firsthand, Lee, that there were police officers that were ready to break protocol to go in that building, you know, to protect the kids. But that was a protocol. And it was real interesting, again, 20 plus years ago, they were planning their attack into the building. And they actually, the police gave me a whiteboard and they wanted me to draw the floor plans of the science wing. And I couldn't even remember the numbers on the classroom. And at one point they said, well, we need to know where all the exit doors, and right now I'm in a state of shock. And then they said, well, Frank, we're planning to enter through the roof of the science wing, and do you know how the ventilation system? And I said, you gotta be kidding me. And that's where we were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now you look at where John and his people are today, they have everything electronically, they know. And it was real interesting, I mentioned earlier the alarm being so loud that the police could not even communicate. At one point, they said, Frank, we know this is beyond the call of duty, but would you be willing to put body armor on to go into the building Mm -hmm. to deactivate the alarm? And I'm getting ready, and all of a sudden it came down, no one's going in the building. And so, um, you know, I remember that, but one of the things that haunts me to this day and until the day I die is we didn't know anything about reunification. We did the very best we could. we were transporting kids from the building at Columbine over to Leewood Elementary, which is probably a half a mile from Columbine. And that was a place where parents were reunited with their kids. But it was probably around 7 o'clock they took me from the mobile stations up on Pierce Street down to Leewood. And I get there, and of course it was just chaotic. And a lot of parents, when they saw me, the first thing they said, because... I had been there for 20 years. Frank, did you see my son? Did you see my daughter? And I, I had not. And then I can remember one of the parents coming up and saying, Frank, I've been looking out the door, and for about the last four hours, there's been yellow school buses transporting our kids. I haven't seen any buses. And that's when a grief counselor came over and said, Frank, uh, we need to take these family members into a room, and you need to tell them there's a good chance. <clears throat> their family members lost their life. And that was something as an educator never prepared yeah, for. Yeah, and all of it, right? Yeah. We never uh, yeah. believed that something like this yeah. could happen. Uh, when we had a chance to interview Sean Graves in our last yeah. podcast, he talked about that too, just what you said. May, maybe maybe it's a senior prank. Yeah. This can't be happening. Yeah. And that it took a while for him to be able to really realize this This is real. This is yeah. the, the, the most unimaginable thing that yeah. could happen is is happening. Um, and then to be able to have to talk to those parents. And it was, it was something, even to this day, when I see those parents, I remember looking in their eyes, and there was nothing you could share at that moment. You, you mm-hmm. can't say, I know how you're feeling. We just held each other, and it was, it was something till this day. And that's part of the reason that I continue to do what I'm doing, because it was interesting that night, uh, the FBI and the police said, Frank, you and your family cannot go back to your house because they were concerned that there still may be threats 
on my life. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up uh, going to my brother's house and it was interesting. All of our cars were impounded at the facility until the bomb squads could make sure that they did not have any devices. And so I'm sitting at my brother's house that night and just going through everything that happened that day. And I realized that there was nothing I can do to bring back those 13, but I was going to do everything in my power to speak on their behalf. And, and that's one of the reasons that I continue to do what I'm doing today, that uh, it's just something that you can't fathom what to do, and you do the very best you could. Mm -hmm. Frank, there's a, there's a raging debate that has started in the last couple of months that I think, frankly, has caught a lot of us off guard, and I'm curious about your perspective. There's people out there saying that uh, these drills, uh, lockdown drills, are traumatizing kids. When you go back to 1999, the only drill that he did was a fire drill. You know, for 20 years, we've been doing lockdown drills and trying to make sure that we're not scaring kids but preparing them. When you hear that you know, we should stop doing these drills, what are your thoughts? It's ironic. Uh, yesterday, I was in Washington, D.C. speaking on behalf of school safety, and someone brought up that question to the panel, and there, there are 21 principles that we brought together last year, and I'm heading up the group. It's called the Principles Recovery Network, and it's principles from around the country in which these school shootings, and that is something right now that NEA and some other teachers' unions are really getting involved with these. And the comment that I made, it's not to scare, but it's to prepare. But in defense of some of these people, I think it's how some of these school districts are conducting, mm -hmm. you know, the drills. And I can teach, I can talk about something that I experienced about three years ago in Ohio, and they were doing an active shooter drill for teachers and administrators. And I think it was in Ohio. And all of a sudden, Frank, all we want you to do to, is to observe. So I'm sitting there and all of a sudden they have kids from the theater program coming out, being shot and blood pouring. And I saw the look on these teachers' face and administrators' face. And I mean, it was very active and real. And, and those teachers were traumatized. And to be honest, mm -hmm. I was traumatized by what I have seen. And, you know, one of the things that I tried to tell legislators yesterday is these drills need to be done. They need to be prepared. Our kids need to be prepared, but it's how you do it. I mean, the way that you're going to do a drill for a high school kid is going to be much different. You know, I can remember the first couple of weeks in which I was volunteering at my uh, granddaughter's kindergarten. They went into a lockdown and all these kids and they're saying, Papa, Papa, what's going on? And, and I said, we're going to be fine. This is if a bad guy comes up. I mean, you're not going to say if a killer comes up or a perp. It's how you deliver the message. Right. But I think to just say we can't do these drills uh, is not going to help. And it's real interesting in talking to people around the country. I, I spent some time yesterday with the principal from Parkland. And in Parkland right now, they have to do an active shooter drill once a month. So month after month after month, and it's re-traumatizing. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to come together, put together be best practices, what works, and, you know, to be prepared. Yeah, I well, think a developmentally appropriate right. um, drill versus a reenactment. Those are two very significantly different things. Well, and when we do a fire drill, we don't set the building on fire. Right. When we right. do a lockdown drill, we shouldn't have gunshots being no. fired. But you can certainly have a conversation. If we can talk to our kids about why we practice for a fire drill, uh, we can certainly talk about the threat of, mm -hmm. well, what do you do when you're under fire without traumatizing right. And I see this, I get asked that question a lot, especially by parents of elementary kids. And I said, well, with my granddaughter, I said, honey, you're going to hold my hand when we cross the street. Or, you know, if a bad guy comes, you do this. And it's not to scare them, but to just not talk about it is not preparing them. Right. But it's this sense, and like you said, Kevin, so brilliantly, is it's appropriateness in what do we do to prepare. Yeah. I think that when we talk about elementary students specifically, too, people... Uh, just like with Columbine before, people would hope that something like this would never happen. And then we're reminded um, Sandy Hook yeah. happened. And so we need to prepare all in the appropriate way. Uh, so 
Columbine was not the first school shooting, but certainly was one of the most televised, Frank. Um, with all that attention, there certainly were many rumors that were floating around out there and some that still persist today. Uh, can you talk about the most common myths or misperceptions that are out there that you want to be sure people know the truth? Boy, that's a great question, Kevin. And people ask me, why are we still talking about Columbine almost 21 years later? And I really attribute it to the media coverage. It was the beginning of the 24-7 news cycle. And within the state of Colorado, I think we went one entire year that there was information about Columbine and stories about Columbine. And unfortunately, back then, the first narrative would come out, people believed. And we didn't have social media the way we have it today. Today, the information is coming out immediately before people even verify it. But one of the things that came out that were still trying to debunk the myths is these two kids were bullied. And I am not going to you know, sit here today and tell you and the people that are listening that there was no bullying going on at Columbine. But what scares me is when the thought is out there, the reason these two did it is they were picked on. And people are going to say, well, yeah, Frank, you were the principal. You're going to defend the school. But I can say unequivocally that was not the cause. And the reason I can say that is these two produced basement tapes for over a year. They were in the basement of one of the parents' home, or their homes, and they were drinking Jack Daniels, and they were playing with their weapons and talking about a step-by-step-by-step -step -step plan. And during those conversations, they didn't talk about bullying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had to listen to those tapes, three and a half hours of tapes, and it's unfortunate that those tapes couldn't have been given to psychologists and criminologists and they have been destroyed. And I understand why, because they were afraid if the media did get those tapes and they would keep playing. And the reason that I'm really concerned about the narrative back then is what it's creating in 2020, in 2019, because there are people out there, kids out there that weren't even born when they hear the story of the two that they are protecting the kids that are marginalized, the kids that are picked on. And even though it was bad what they did, you know, they were protecting kids like me, and that was not the narrative. Mm -hmm. And there's so many, if you look at it historically, the shooter from um, Sandy Hook, the shooter from Virginia Tech all made mention of the killers from Columbine. Uh, last year, Brazil and Australia, the same thing. And so we need to change that narrative and saying that had nothing to do. These were two cold-hearted killers. You know, I truly believe in looking at the journals, looking at the videotapes of Harris, that he was a psychopath. And even Mrs. Klebold, when she produced her book, said her kid was in a state of depression, but mm -hmm. she said bullying did mm -hmm. not have anything to do with it. And uh, others, like you mentioned, and John, maybe you can talk to this, look to those records as inspiration, as opposed to a, a lesson about what we should be watching for and not doing. Well, and, and you know, the Secret Service report that just came out a couple of uh, months ago, uh, looking at the past uh, 10 years of school shootings identified that, uh, unfortunately, school shooters of today are often inspired by the killers and and they research them and, and learn from them. And, you know, what you're talking about is, is, you know, a narrative that's out there that's not truthful. And it's unfortunate because it's taken on kind of a life cycle of its own. And it's something that we fight against every day. And uh, I, I don't see it going away. So one of my messages to people, educators, parents, if you have a student that becomes um, very interested and fascinated with the Columbine tragedy, pay close attention to this. And it was interesting yesterday in meeting with the principals from other states in which these shootings occurred, they said, Frank... The two from Columbine motivated the shooters at their school from the, wearing the black trench coat to having the plan. And the thing that's horrifying is when they made their declaration of what they wanted to do, uh, guns were not a major part of that. Their plan was to blow up the school. And they placed two propane tanks in the cafeteria, and they knew exactly what the number was going to be. They placed the bombs, and their intent is they said, we're not going to do it like these previous ones. We're going to do it right, and we're going to blow up the school, which 
if those bombs would have exploded, it probably would have killed six to 700 people. So that, you know, was their plan on what to do. And when the bombs did not explode, then that's when they came into the building. But this was a drawn out plan. And, and just to reiterate, you know, supposedly there was a hit list and, you know, if bullying was taking place and they wanted to go after certain kids, they would have known where to go find those kids. But when you place two propane tanks in a cafeteria, you're not discriminating right. against anyone. You're going to kill anyone that was in there. And so it's an interesting concept. But I know there's First Amendment rights and things like this, but some of the stuff that's on the Internet, I think, is really offering motivation to some of these other shooters, John, and I'm sure you can attest to that. Well, that's concerning. And, it, it, you know, it's something that we continually have to talk to our kids about, especially – kids that are in crisis that are showing signs of mm -hmm. attack behavior and how do you get them off of this nexus so that, you know, they're focusing on the right thing and, and not going down the path of violence. We know that, you know, these tragedies don't just happen one day. They're planned and thought out. And, and, you know, so I think there's so many lessons learned. People say, why is Columbine still relevant 21 years later? It's relevant because we continue to see the same cycle mm -hmm. over and over again and we continue to see the same mistakes made over and over again from you know a, a missed threat assessment to um an inability to prepare and plan and respond and then recover and, and communities around this country are struggling with that we've got to do a better job well and i think to build upon that and that's just excellent what you just said but one of the things we need to do is empower our kids because in talking to john nicoletti who's a friend of the center and has helped very much in jeffco um you know one of the things he said is these kids are broadcasting mm -hmm. and if they are broadcasting then we need to empower these kids to come forward and share with us you know see something say something and then as adults we need to do something mm -hmm. and so you know when what worries me today, even more so than 20 years ago, is the role that social media is playing in the lives of our kids. And there's so much out there. And we can no longer state, well, someone is just kidding or just teasing. And I think as adults, as educators, Kevin, I know when you were a principal, you really had to take these seriously and you Absolutely. had to let the kids know that. Yeah. And at the same time, we have that positive hope, right? We don't want to believe that kids may be thinking or feeling some of these things. So... Um, that's when the word just comes up. And John and I, I know, have talked a lot about that. That word just is the one that gets you in trouble. When, well, they were just kidding. Right. It was just a kid. It was just that day. That's not like them. Uh, all of them need to be taken seriously. When somebody says something, we're going to choose to believe you and then uh, move forward to get you the supports that you need and make sure that you and, and everyone else is, is safe. Um, Frank, you mentioned a little bit the group of principals that uh, have gotten together. That was not random. Um, you have made it your personal commitment to reach out uh, to principals who've experienced these things in their communities. Talk a little bit about, about that. Right. I made a promise. I can remember it was um, right after the Columbine tragedy. I received a phone call from Bill Bond, who was a principal at Paducah High School, or excuse me, Heath High School in Paducah, Kentucky. And he called me and he said, Frank, here's my number. You don't even know what you need, but I'm here every step of the way. And that really resonated with me. So I made a promise after that happened to do the same mm -hmm. because I had so much support from him and principals from Jonesboro and Pearl, Mississippi, you know, shootings that had occurred, uh, you know, in the 90s prior to Columbine. So I have reached out in... The thing that's real interesting, and I had this discussion yesterday, originally when I started, people are just inundated of phone calls and they didn't pick up. And many times it would take a month or so to make those connections. But now, you know, whether it be Parkland, and just alone in 2018, it was Parkland, it was Marshall County, there was a shooting in uh, the Great Mills in Maryland. And within 24 hours, the principals are calling me. And it was interesting that they said, we get all these phone calls, but when we see the principal from Columbine, we know that he can help. And I made a comment 
right after Columbine happened, as I said, I just joined a club in which no one wants to be a member. And it's not that I'm an expert, but if I was to call, like for example, last year when we had the unfortunate shooting over at the STEM Academy, when I talked to that director and said, I know what you're feeling, there's that instant mm-hmm. connectiveness. And it's not to diminish the experts. You know, John is an expert. We, AJ DeAndrea, you've worked with child things. But it's the, just saying this is what we're going through. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting. Uh, just recently there was a shooting in Santa Clarita at Sangus High School, I think, in California. And same thing, I called Vince uh, Ferry, who's the principal there, and he saw my number come across and he got back to me immediately. And it's just... a you know, kind of help support people. And it's, and so last year when the National Association of Secondary School Principals said, Frank, would you be interested in heading this committee up? And it's really worked. My biggest hope is that the membership doesn't continue to grow. Well, and I think this is an important group because we were talking earlier today that politics seem to really become a massive part of the response today and and left right doesn't matter everybody wants their say um you all seem to bring a practical application to the conversation and, and a realistic uh understanding and viewpoint that can help people debunk some of this how much has politics either hindered or helped uh over the years when we talk about school safety I think it's hindered from the standpoint that when politicians will not even listen to the other side, because the thing that is so important that I feel is they're all of our kids and what is in the best Mm -hmm. interest of our kids. And what scares me with certain politicians, politicians is when they state there is one fix all. And I do not buy that. Uh, A good example is I had a, discussion with the politician from Florida after the um, Parkland shooting. And he said, Frank, I can guarantee you a hundred percent if we have tougher gun laws, there will never be another school shooting. He's, and I said, hundred percent. He said, I'll guarantee. And I said, and he asked me what I felt. And I said, I disagree. And he said, well, you were at Columbine. Why wouldn't you? And I said, that's one piece to the puzzle. I said, are there loopholes in gun laws? Are there things that we need to look common sense? But that's not the fix all. I said, let's talk about situations where kids are struggling and they need help. And I worry, and a lot of the legislation yesterday is to provide counselors, to provide social workers for schools as opposed to cutting them. You know, things like that. Let's talk about social media. Let's talk about the family structure. Because I look at the family structure, and you were in education. When we first started, the family structure was a mo- lot more stable. Yeah. But towards That's the end right. of our career, I saw grandparents, great-grandparents trying to raise adolescents. Doing everything they could to help. Exactly. Absolutely. And so these, when you put all these pieces of the puzzle together, then we have a chance. But I don't think, in my humble opinion, I don't think someone can get up and say, if we do this one thing, it's going to stop it. You know, and... And it was interesting. Yesterday we had the discussion and they said, well, Frank, what about cameras? What about gates? That's part of it. But we also have to look at creating an inclusive environment, uh, creating an environment where kids feel comfortable Mm -hmm. sharing with adults. And that's all part of it. And and unfortunately, many times that's difficult to measure. I mean, you put, well, we have 90 cameras, we have these gates, we have this. Those are visible things. But how do you measure how a kid is feeling or whether or not he's feeling safe? And we need to continue to work on these programs and create an environment in which kids feel safe. You can measure a lot, but measuring prevention is really challenging. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How do you know what you prevented? Right. How do you know what you're, what you're accomplishing when you prevent? And so, Frank, you talked a little bit about um, some mental health pieces. I know one of the many lessons that you share with those who you touch, including that group of principals, uh, is the importance of self-care. Talk about kind of your journey through um, allowing yourself to get some self-care. It was real interesting. And when I go out and I tell people, Hopefully you never have to go through a Columbine, but you're going to go through something difficult in your life and you don't have to travel that journey alone. And it's real interesting, depending on the group that I'm talking to, and I do a lot of work with 
police officers and firefighters and things, they don't like to hear that message because they're supposed to be tough responsible. Guys, We're right? tough guys. We're we don't need counseling, and I can't. And I'm, you know, again, not knowing the statistics, but I truly believe that there's a higher rate of suicide, uh, you know, alcoholism amongst those groups because they don't mm -hmm. seek that help. And for me, again, I am not, when I go out and I'm very upfront that I'm not trying to prosthesize or convert you to faith, but my faith was very important to mm -hmm. me. You know, it was a couple of days after, and for the first time in my life, I was questioning my faith because I was sitting in the, my bro at my brother's house that night, in my brother's house, and said, God, how could you lay allow this to happen? I mean, I saw a kid with, had been shot, and I walked through pools of blood, and I was really doubting my faith for the first time in my life. And then it was a couple of days later, Father Ken Leone called me down to St. Francis Cabrini, where I had been a member of the parish. He called me up on the altar. There was about 1,200 people there, a lot of the kids from Columbine that were part of the youth group. And he whispered something in my ear, and he said, Frank, he said, in his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his step, and God's got a plan for you. And he said, you never have to work that journey alone. And he said, there's going to be tough times. And he said, many times difficulties are really blessings in disguise. And so that helped me. And it was real interesting. I actually had people tell me, you know, as an administrator, you better be careful in seeking counseling because that's a sign of weakness. Mm -hmm. And if you tell anyone, they're going to deem you unfit for duty. Now, I'm full-blooded Italian and I'm stubborn. And so <laughs> probably the best phone call I received was from a chiropractor my mom worked for john fisher he called me within 24 hours and he was a vietnam veteran and he said frank i never got the help that i needed and i'm paying it forward mm -hmm. you know marriage wise um business wise and i what i share now with people if you don't go out and get yourself help you can't help others and i use the analogy when you're on an airplane and the flight attendant comes on and says if for some reason this cabin loses pressure there's going to be a mass that drops down before you help help that child next year or the elderly put it on yourself and it's self-help mm -hmm. and i would not have been able to fulfill what father ken told me to do if i didn't seek counseling mm -hmm. and so it's not a sign of weakness it's a sign of Absolute strength sign of strength uh, so we did have a chance to talk like i mentioned earlier uh with one of your kids sean graves uh, in our last podcast he talked a little bit about columbine beyond the tragedy uh, so often this school is identified by the event, but we know it so much more. So what are your thoughts about Columbine beyond this specific event? Well, Columbine is a special place. You know, it was a great school. It continues to be a great school. And Sean Graves, even though he's a young adult, um, he'll always be one of my kids. And I don't know if he shared with you, but probably one of the turning points as far as Columbine healing is when he was a senior and getting ready for graduation and we're at Fiddler's Green and I mean it was the last class to graduate they were the freshmen at the time and Sean had spent most of his time in the wheelchair because of the you know, damage done to him and as they called his name I mean people are just yelling and screaming and he gets up out of the wheelchair and walks across the mm. stage and said, Mr. D, I'm here to get my diploma. Nice. And that just resonated with our community saying you can overcome anything. You know, and I think that's where we all are. Um, you know, Sean, Patrick Ireland, Richard Costello, all the students that represent Columbine is we had one of the worst events that could possibly happen. And what we want to do is I think what is symbolic is something we coined the first year. It's a time to remember. We're going to remember the 13 who lost their lives, the 24 who were injured, everyone that was deeply impacted. But Columbine represents hope. And yesterday when I was getting ready, we were all getting ready to leave and saying our goodbyes. And they said, Frank, the one thing by having you here is we're into this one year, two year, three years, but we see how strong Columbine is 20 years later. Mm -hmm. And that provides hope for us. And I think that's what it is. And I think the Sean Graves and all the other students will go out and we, you know, we got the saying rebels for life and no one could ever take that mm -hmm. away. And it was interesting when the elementary school kids came up to Columbine and I promised to stay with them until they graduated. 
And they said, Mr. D, when you go out and talk to people, can you tell them we're not a bad school and we're not bad kids? Mm -hmm. And so that's our mission. Mm -hmm. We did. We talked about that a little bit too with Sean, that today's kids who are at the school, um, the general public out there, because it's in the the news all the time, um, thinks that today's kids were there. Um, They weren't. They are part of the tradition of what it means to be a rebel and at Columbine and there is something different to it because of the the tragedy, but because of something so much more, too. Oh. And I really do. I think part of it is it was a strong school mm-hmm. and a lot of tradition and a lot of family before. And, you know, that was one of the things, you know, there are principals out there a lot smarter and a lot taller than I am. And, uh, but as far as passion, um, I love my kids mm-hmm. and, you know, I tell administrators, yes, we need to make sure that we're preparing kids to be successful, you know, through math, science, things of that nature. But don't underestimate teaching those lifetime skills. And I think in these situations, it's all about relationships, those adults that are uh, there for the kids. And that's mm-hmm. so important. And I look at one of the things I'm most proud of Columbine We've had over 30 former students of mine that have been teachers at Columbine High School Mm. and that Rebel Pride, and it helped us get through. As a matter of fact, right now there are five teachers teaching there that were actually students when the tragedy, and boy, it brings a whole different perspective. Mm. We've worked a lot of tragedies together um, over the years, far too many. Um, When you think about sharing a message with, with educators, with principals today, what would you tell a principal in terms of preparing themselves to lead through crisis? What's a something that you can think of that you would help um, gift them with a thought or, or a process that they can think about? I think leading through crisis, um, one of the things is you have to surround yourself with a good team, and I was so blessed to have the, that in place. But the thing that's interesting in a situation, and it was an eye-opener for me, is we had 150 staff members that witnessed the events of that day, 2,000 students, and everyone heals differently. And even though we all witnessed similar things and people were in different places, but what I learned is you had some staff members who felt, we need to talk about this, we need to talk about it. And we had others saying, as soon as I get back to doing what I was doing yesterday, that's going to help me heal. And we had some people in between. And so trying to meet the needs of everything. And it it was very interesting because uh, stuff that you never anticipated um, as a principal. And I shared this, and when these principals come back to me and said, Frank, we never thought about it. We, we could not have balloons at Columbine right after the tragedy because of balloon pop, kids were diving, you know, if doors slammed. Mm-hmm. And they said, this is stuff we never thought of. Every principal that experienced a school shooting, they call me around graduation. How do, what do we do at graduation to honor and, you know, mm-hmm. things of that nature, stuff that you don't learn when you're getting your education or your principal's license. So those are things. But I think the, as a leader... Uh, number one, as I stated time and time again, you need to take care of yourself. And to be honest, I tell people this right now, that if a Columbine happened today, I don't know if I could have kept my job for 15 years after. And we talked a little bit about politics, but I was so fortunate that we had a school board president who's still involved in Jefferson County, John mm-hmm. Stefano, And it was the day after... And um, one of my assistant principals, Kevin Land, picked me up and he took me over to the Ed Center to meet with the school board and superintendent. And I walked in the office to jo- with John and I, I offered to resign. I said, John, I was a principal of school. Those kids walked in and they never went home again. And I'm responsible. And he said, Frank, you're not going anywhere. He said, if you decide you want a different placement, we'll let that happen. But you were the principal yesterday and you're going to continue to be the principal. And... I had a lot of support. I really did because of the 20 years, but I had some detractors. But John would not, he would not, he backed me the entire time. And all we have to do is look to Parkland, Florida. And I spent some quality time with uh, Ty Thompson. And it was last year. And he said, Frank, I need some advice. And I said, Ty, 
as much as I hate to say this, you need to look to leave because I saw the writing on the wall and there was finger pointing and they had a governor's commission and we had a commission here in which um, I had to testify, but it was an unbiased position. But the council that they had in Parkland had three families who had lost their kids that was very traumatized by everything. Mm -hmm. And so within a year, all the administrative team was missing from Parkland. And so, you know, one of the things that I state is you need to make sure that you're going to be in a, it's going to be tough to succeed anyway, but you need to make sure you have a plan in place that's going to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you share some of your uh, leadership lessons and learning uh, through a book that you've written. They call me Mr. D. Uh, tell us more about how you came to write this book and what you hope will come yeah. as a result. It was interesting. Um, right after everything happened, I was approached to do you know, go out and do speaking and, you know, write a book. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. The only thing on my mind is rebuilding that community. Now, there were times in which these events happened, you know, Sandy Hook, Virginia Tech, Chardon, um, Ohio, that they would call our superintendent, Dr. Stevenson, and said, is there any way Frank could come out and help us? Help us. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Stevens so gr graciously allowed me to go to these various places to go out. But as far as doing some of the stuff I'm doing now, and people ask me, well, you got into speaking and this book, right? I said, that did not even cross my mind until mm -hmm. I retired. And, and so it was um, when I retired, a dear friend of mine that I played some high school ball with, Terry Fry, was at Wheat Ridge. He was a farmer and I was a random raider. And he said, if you ever decide to write a book, let me know. And so it was a couple of years after I retired. And it was interesting when I did go out to do some presentations, people would come up and say, Frank, have you ever thought about writing a book? And so basically I sat down and wrote this book. And it really is a journey in life. And it was interesting because the publisher at times wanted to go a different direction and talk about that day and day and day. And I said, there's plenty of books out there about that. Let's talk about healing. And so uh, we're fortunate enough to get a publisher, and so all the proceeds from sales are going to go to the uh, Columbine Memorial and then the academic Frank D'Angelo's Academic Foundation, and then for the Safety Center. You know, and so, mm -hmm. but it's a book. I think uh, it's it's a roadmap, and I think it's a book of hope. And then the thing that I'm really proud is the last chapter, and I got permission from the families. The last chapter really talks about each of the 13 and actually taken from what is written about each of the 13. And so, mm -hmm. unfortunately, in so many of these tragedies, we know the names of the shooters or the killers, and we don't know the names of the victims. Mm -hmm. And I said, as long as I'm alive, we're going to know who those 13 were that day. Absolutely. So the foundation and the training center uh, proudly carry your name. What is your greatest hope connected to the work carried out at the center and through the foundation? I think the most important thing is, and I'm so blessed to be able to work with you two because not only are you great professionals that I have respect, but you're dear friends. We've been through so much together. But I think the most important thing is instead of being reactive, we need to be proactive. And I think people feel that if we don't talk about it, then it's not going to happen. And, and that's too bad that there's that perception out there. And as I stated earlier, it's not to scare, it's to prepare. And I just see some of the work that you're doing. And a lot of times we're so close to it that we don't realize the impact that this is happening. Happening, And I know when I get an opportunity to travel to other states and they talk and they said, tell us about this center, you know, and what John is doing and what Kevin's doing. And I mean, this is one of a kind. And, you know, and what we're hoping is that other states continue to do some of this and we build upon it because I think so many times, and this was my role as a principal, I think there were people, if you have an idea, you want to keep it from others. But if it's something that can help others they're all of our kids. Yeah, Why not right. share it? And I know when people ask me, and I can't remember, um, I was presenting at a conference and someone was asking me some information. I said, I know the exact person that's going to help you with this. And I gave him John's number mm -hmm. because he's out there and I can call you, uh, have people call you. And, it, and it's not to say, you know, Jeff, go, we're great, great, great. We have this thing, but why not share it? Because they're all of our kids. And I think it doesn't matter if it's California, Texas, 
we want to keep all of our kids safe. Mm-hmm. And what we have here is so unique. And we just need to make sure that we continue to get the support from the state legislators, uh, you know, in different groups, because we truly are making a difference. So Ron Mitchell, who you mentioned earlier, uh, said something that has stuck with me too, uh, that I think is at the heart of the foundation and the, and the center itself. And that's that um, as a result of being here and being part of Jeff- Jefferson County and, and Columbine, that we feel a commitment at our very core to share what it is that we've learned so that others don't have to. Um, and that really is a driving force. I know, John, you speak regularly about how the safety and security industry has become just that, uh, an industry that is uh, making a lot of money yep. out there. Multi-billion. And that's dollars. right. And that's that's not um, our mission no. and our driving force. It's that no one should be denied access to the lessons learned so that they can keep their community, their kids, their staff safe. Um, so that, Frank, I want to thank you again. And John, thank you for your time today and your daily commitment to keeping students and staff and community safe uh, in Jeffco and beyond across the nation and internationally as well. I know you both uh, support people all across the globe. Uh, we certainly are lucky to have you sharing your story while being a part of this important work. This conversation has been brought to you by the Jeffco DeAngelis Foundation. More information can be found out about the foundation at www.deangeliscenter.org.